Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about using Neo4j in an Elixir project to make a social networking clone. So who here has heard of Neo4j? OK, so who's actually used a graph database before in production? OK, <laughs> so, well, me neither, so it's all good. Um, so I'm Regina Imhoff. I live in Austin, Texas. I'm a freelance mobile developer. And I'm also a knitter and a spinner in addition to coding, and I'm happy to bring all those things together. Um, I can be found on Twitter and GitHub as Stabby McDuck, and on Ravelry as Blue Rosebud, and if you know the joke, five hundred points for you. Um, if you're not familiar with Ravelry, you'll learn a lot more about that during this talk. And to be super clear, I am not affiliated with Ravelry. I'm not affiliated with Neo4j. <laughs> I'm just somebody who tried using it in an Elixir project. Um, and then the repo for the project can be found at that URL, Stabby McDuck Elixir Ravelry. So I said this is Neo4j, but Neo4j is unfamiliar to a lot of people, so it's a NoSQL graph database. And as it's not a SQL database, it doesn't use SQL queries, but it rather it uses Cypher, which is a declarative query language for graph databases. Neo4j is different than many other NoSQL, like MongoDB, because it's ACID compliant, just like a SQL database, and fully transactional. Neo4j has the standard create, read, update, and delete commands, just like SQL databases. And it really shines at connected data. So when I thought of connected data, I immediately thought of like a social network. But there's tons of other uses for graph databases. Um, you could do it for using graph queries. Uh, doing graph searches, um, doing real-time recommendations for products is another one. Uh, for example, Walmart uses Neo4j for real-time recommendations to model online shoppers' behavior and the relationships between shoppers and products. So what is a graph? Um, it is not a bar graph. It's not a pie chart. It's um, graph theory is what we're talking about. So you might remember that if you took an algorithms or a discrete math class. So broadly speaking, graphs are structures that are used to model relations between objects. So I'll be talking a little bit of gra graph theory just because it's the backbone for how graph databases work. So here's a super simple social graph modeling users following each other like they would on Twitter. So you have a node, which could also you've probably heard it called a vertex or a point in math class. Here our node is called Annie. And we have other nodes, Betty and Charles. Between the nodes, we have relationships. You may have also heard these called arcs, or edges, or lines. Um, in graph theory, these relationships can be directed, bi-directed, or undirected. But in graph databases, we have directed relationships. So this means that the relationship starts at one node and goes to another specific node, and the direction is one way. So at the top, we have two relationships between Annie and Betty. There's two relationships because in this case, the fact that Annie follows Betty has no impact on whether or not Betty follows Annie. So you just learned all about graph databases. <laughs> so that's the basic structure of a graph database. The model used for this is called a labeled property graph model, and it has a few characteristics to note. We have nodes, which contain properties, and they can also be thought of as key value pairs. And they have one or more labels attached to the node. We also have relationships, which are named and directed. Relationships must have a start and an end node, and they can only have a start and an end node. Relationships can also contain properties, but they're not required. So why would you want to use a graph database? Uh, performance is probably the most obvious answer to that uh, when you're talking about connected data. So connected data has a habit of needing a lot of joins in a SQL query. And those joint intensive SQL queries get worse and worse as the data set gets bigger and bigger. Meanwhile, graph database performance doing the same searches remains mostly constant because we're able to localize searches to the section of the graph. Even when the data set gets bigger, we can still keep our searches localized to maintain performance. Uh, graph databases are also flexible. Uh, they're additive, meaning you can add new nodes, relationships, labels, whatever you want without affecting the existing queries you have. It's so flexible, you don't actually have to model domains as rigorously as you may want to with a SQL database um, before you start your project. 
So it saves a lot of developer time. And lastly, graph databases are agile and schema-free. So because they're flexible, you can change the data model as you develop and as new business requirements come up. So about my project, I made a small clone of the API for the Ravelry website. So Ravelry is a social networking site for the fiber arts community. So knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and making yarn. So you can also buy and sell yarn, fiber and patterns, as well as special interest uh, chat groups, and talk with other members about pretty much anything. So I'll be talking a little bit about the manufacturing of yarn, um, just so that you could see why I uh, modeled my relations the way I did. So we'll be getting from this sheep to that hand spun. And this is mostly so you can see my hand spun yarn. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so first, uh, we have start with some wool. And we card it. And carding is the process of detangling, cleaning, and intermixing fibers to a uh, long sliver of fiber. So it starts with wool which I have described as a node, and it has a relationship of being material for the roving. It's done by a person, either with these big carding paddles like you see here, uh, or by a machine, and you have a user that has a relationship of carding, of cards to the roving. And you can have more than one user doing the carding as well. It's a good idea to think of the relationship between nodes as being more phrase-like than you would use like in a normal foreign key. So the relationship is material for, which has an ID, but it's not to be confused as the SQL foreign key of material ID. So this is the same model of the carding from the previous slide, except it shows that there's a relationship of owns to indicate that even though a person may be working on the product at various stages, the ownership of the product also exists separately. I'm not going to add the ownership model to everything uh, because it's going to get really hairy pretty soon with all the owns, so um, just remember that that's also implicitly in all these. So after the carding, the wool is referred to as roving, and it can be dyed. So there's lots of ways to dye the roving, and again, one or more people may be involved in this process. And we have our carding node from the previous slide, which is now material for the dyed roving, and we have a user who dyes the roving to make the dyed roving. Uh, similarly, after dyed roving, it's material for the yarn, so we're reusing the relationship material for several times. There's lots of ways to spin yarn, including spinning wheels and drop spindles, um, and the dyed roving node is now material for spinning, and the user can spin. So just so you can see what I'm talking about, spun yarn is made up of one or more plies of roving that spun one direction, and then you spin it again together. Um, on the right, you can see there's a single ply that's spun with another ply to make two-ply yarn, and you can make multiple plies, or the yarn can be spun upon itself, or it can be used just as a single ply. So our spinning model is a little more complicated. So <laughs> here's a larger view of the spinning model. So not all roving needs to be dyed, and we can entirely skip the dyeing process and go from carding directly to spinning, and we can also combine more than one roving together while spinning, and we have the option of spun ply looping back and being made material for more spinning ply. At this point, we have a finished yarn, and we're going to use it in a project. So a user here has a relationship of knits, but you can have lots of different other relationships like crochets or weaving. And the project can have some sort of pattern associated with it, and the pattern itself has an author associated with it. So here's the whole process from beginning to end. It's a little small, but it's complicated is basically the point. <laughs> but ruh -roh, we have a big problem. Um, if there's any knitters in the room, don't worry. This is a seriously far-fetched problem. Um, but somebody who knitted a skein of our yarn has tested positive for anthrax. So anthrax is an infection caused by a bacterium, and a small blister can form, and it's spread by contact with the spores of uh, bacillus anthracis, and it's very rare, and it primarily occurs with people who work with livestock and livestock products, like our wool. <laughs> so we're going to need to find all the people who are involved in the production of this yarn to test all of them, too. So if we're going to do a SQL query for this, it's going to get bad. 
So we need to work backwards, right? So we start um, from our yarn, we can work back to who the spinner was. So the SQL query will query who spun the yarn, who knitted it by somebody. Here we named them Bob. Uh, we're going to select all the knitters from the users, interjoin the spinning from the IDs that match, interjoin the yarn, interjoins everywhere. <laughs> Again, with the dyed roving, the same thing. We have to dye, do all those joins together to figure out who did it. But there's more. So now we have to do it for the roving as well. So all those interjoins as well. It just keeps going. And this is a pretty easy process. Imagine if you have like a large distribution and you have to do it from multiple dialogues or multiple different processes. It can get really ugly really fast. But luckily, we were smart and we used the graph database. So with Cypher query, this is it. <laughs> so Cypher is a declarative graph query language made by the folks at New 4 j So here's the entire Cypher query that replaces the 35 lines of SQL query that we did and accomplishes the same goal. So let's go over this query. So the match is exactly what you think it means. It's matching whatever comes after it. The single letters you see before the colon are just variables that we can attach to make queries easier for us to use, and they're optional. Anything in the parentheses indicates that we're talking about a node. So here we have nodes for user and a node for yarn. The square brackets indicate a relationship. So we have a relationship of owns between user and yarn. So the user who owns a yarn, because that's who had the problem, and the relationship of a star between yarn and user. And the star in the relationship bracket indicates it's a variable length path. So this means that one or more relationships between y yarn and q user will be queried. You can specify how much, how much the length of the path you want here too, but in our case we really don't care. We want all of them all the way back. So where you see a colon followed by a word, that's a type. So types are the overarching names that we can give to relationships and nodes. So here we have a node with types user and yarn and relationship with the types owns. And then the arrow in the middle of our match indicates it's a directed relationship. So the query of the match to match the node user P that has a relationship of owns to the yarn and find all the users associated with that yarn with the name Sherlock. And we return all the users with some relationship to this yarn. So unlike in SQL, where the returning statement is optional, return is required in Cypher. Cypher allows us to completely gloss over all the joins that we had to write in SQL. So a little bit more about Cypher and Neo4j. Neo4j installs with a browser that you can use to make queries, visualize your data, and interact with your data. So one word of caution, though, is that if you make new nodes and relationships in the browser, it's going to populate your actual database, and in my case, make all your tests fail. <laughs> so make sure you clean anything out that you add in the browser. So here's a quick look at the browser. Uh, you can make queries like how you have at the top there, and you can uh, find all the people that would match that query um, as you're doing it. It's a pretty slick little tool. It's um, similar to PG Admin. So how are we able to use Neo4j in an Elixir project? Luckily, we have a few brave souls who made Bolt SIPs, which is a Neo4j driver for Elixir. So it's similar to Postgrex in that it's a driver to the database, but it operates at a much lower level than Ecto. It uses the Bolt protocol, which is the newest network protocol from Neo4j. So if you go Googling, you'll likely see Neo4j.sips as well, which uses an older network protocol, and it doesn't offer the uh, high performance that Bolt SIPs offers. So I use Bolt SIPs in my project. And Bolt SIPs uh, supports transactions in Cypher queries as well as taking care of connection pool implementation with Poolboy. So what about Ecto? <laughs> the biggest challenge with using Neo4j in Elixir is Ecto. <laughs> so Ecto is composed of Ecto query, Ecto repo, and Ecto schema. Ecto query was designed for SQL databases and has been adapted to work with MongoDB. And EctoQuery doesn't share the same keywords that Cypher uses, and there's no one-to-one -one translation of EctoQuery to Cypher. So EctoQuery won't actually work for our purposes. Uh, don't be scared, though. 
Ecto repo doesn't have an adapter for Neo4j, and Ecto schema doesn't support nodes, and more importantly, relationships. So you may be thinking, why do we even bother trying this? <laughs> um, so we can't use Ecto adapter SQL sandbox because there's no Ecto adapter and there isn't any SQL. <laughs> so instead we have to manage the transactions ourselves. Florin, the maintainer of Bolt Sips, was kind enough to open a PR to make these transactions into a case template instead of having it copied into every test like I had. Um, so we begin and roll back work on beginning and rolling back the transaction just like in SQL. And con is the really important part about this. Um, it puts the bolt sips con into the plug con so the controller can use the bolt sips con that's already in the transaction. This way the tests don't pollute the database. So one downside of using Neo4j is that there isn't a good way that I was able to find of making a new database like one explicitly for test without creating a new directory structure like how you can with a SQL database. Bolt sips con is a function in the controller EX file. BoltSipsCon takes in the plug connection and we look for the private connection in the map. Get lazy is used to ensure that we only make one connection instead of making multiple connections that could lead to confusion and eat up memory. The index function I show here is for the died roving controller and it's just an example of how to use BoltSipsCon to ensure that we use the test connection in a transaction when it's available. The index function takes in the plug -in connection we take that to the plug connection and pipe it to the bolt sips con to get the test connection. And if it's available, or um, set up a new connection if there is no test connection, and then pipe the connection to the repo list. So as I was writing the different repos for the different nodes and relationships, I noticed a pattern of writing the same code over and over again. So I pulled out this macro to make it more generic for all the nodes. And there's a similar one for all the relationships. So this macro defines default implementation for get, graph, and list for nodes as they don't depend on the types of individual fields. Uh, the behavior of get, list, and graph also require row to struct and create because they contain the types. Uh, because there's no Ecto adapter, we can't use the types in Ecto schema, and instead we have to do the type conversions manually. So I did end up using the echo types and echo change set to cast the params to create the controller actions. So here's the owns create, which creates a relationship of type owns. And you'll see that there's a call to repo to timestamp. That's because there's no echo adapter to, and we have to manually translate the echo date time to the Unix timestamp, which is the time type that Neo4j understands. So broadly speaking, Neo4j is less type rich than Postgres, which is why I had to do more type conversions than you'd originally think. <laughs> um, so likewise, row to struct, we have to translate from Neo4j understandable Unix timestamp back to Ecto's date time. And here's the row to struct function for a relationship, and you'll see that there's start and end fields. So to make the relationships work better in Ecto, we map start and end to specific foreign key names. This way we can have Ecto do more work for us. So the weird meta field here is, to sh um, is stuff that's normally filled in and taken care of by Ecto adapters. But again, there's no Neo4j Ecto adapter. Uh, so I had to fill this in manually. So if the metadata state isn't filled in, then the default value is colon built. Built and load uh, change the way that the change set functions work, so it's important to fill this in explicitly. So to construct a graph, we have to match on the starting node, which is looked up by ID. So you'll notice we look up the node ID by using the ID function. Uh, this is because IDs in Neo4j cannot be looked out with dot ID like in SQL. Uh, we have to explicitly cast to to integer because parameterized values aren't cast automatically like in Postgres. And next we will figure out the direction of the graph by taking in the direction of either forward, backward, or both. Uh, users may not care about the backwards graph because they only care about how, they made, how things they made are going forward. But if you're making a sweater out of hand spun yarn and you run out of yarn and you only have half a finished sweater, you need to be able to work backwards and figure out how to source all that stuff. <laughs> Um, so with, in Cypher queries, uh, 
Uh, with in Cypher queries can be tricky. Uh, with is a hard line in the sand. Only names declared as outputs can be used in with. So any pre-existing named function uh, variables are completely hidden after the with line. I found that out with all my test breaking again. So with doesn't have to be the last line before the return. It can be used for filtering to break up uh, multiple subqueries as well. So the trickiness is with with is why there's only one line in this query. I tried having a with for each direction, and um, I couldn't return all the users, which led to a lot of problems. Um, so unlike with match, unlike with, match and optional match doesn't hide any previously matched variables. The graph for both directions can have both of the line for forward followed by the line for backward. So you'll notice that in the relationship here, we have a star, zero, dot, dot, unlike several slides back where I had just a star. So the zero, dot, dot overrides the default minimum of one or more that the star has, which allows us to have zero or more relationships. So when there's zero relationships, there's no source or sync node, and the source and sync nodes collapse into N, the node that we're starting from. This ensures that if the graph only has the node itself, the graph is still returned. Um, if, they, if there is one or more nodes, you'll get the middle node back from both the forward and the backwards path. And I wasn't able to figure out a good way to eliminate that without wrecking the whole graph. Um, but I did able to um, eliminate the duplicate node in Cypher. Um, so I wasn't able to do it in Cypher, but I was able to do it with enum unique on the combined list of source and sync nodes to work around this. So here we are filtering for those users who worked on this project that may have tested positive for anthrax. We filter backwards from the project since the knitter is the one who started this scare and we want to go backwards. We filter by type of user because we want to start have, find all of the people involved regardless of their role in the manufacturing of this product. So here's the whole um, query in the code. So you'll notice um, that there's several, several areas here where we have interpolation with a hash and curly braces, but also just curly braces, such as in the two integer ID call. Uh, this is because either bolt zips or the bolt protocol, I wasn't sure who was really to blame, uh, won't allow types to be parameterized like values. So we have to parameterize the types with elixir interpolation and pass the values as parameters instead of simply interpolating everything because interpolation means that we have to manually protect against exploitation. So here there's several areas where we have inter... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so here's the several parts. So those two different areas. Um, so, so far I've shown a pretty basic CRUD API, and it doesn't do anything real time. Uh, but by using Phoenix sockets, we can let people subscribe to only receiving updates to the graph instead of having to hit the API to get the entire graph back each and every time. So for instance, Chris is a dyer, and she wants to see what project people make from her dyed roving that they purchased from her Etsy store. By subscribing to updates on her dyed roving ID, she can see the projects created when knitters link their projects in the graph. She can use it to connect with uh, knitters on her Instagram account or contact those users about new available colorways or all sorts of reasons. So we want to see the changes in the graph as it's updated, but we don't want to have to send the whole graph each and every time. The solution is to store the previously sent graph on the socket and compare the differences. Uh, so the graph topic monitors a specific node ID for when the graph grows. Because individual nodes are created before the relationships, the graph can only grow when a relationship is created. So we need to monitor when relationships are created, not when nodes are created. And I'll show you a little reason why. So here's the dyed roving node like we were talking about before. Krista starts with her dyed roving and she subscribes to updates on that. Somebody else adds yarn to the network. There's no relationship between the dyed roving and the yarn, so the two are just separate nodes floating in space. The subscription on dyed roving, I, dyed roving doesn't know anything about the yarn yet, and this reflects the fact that in Ravelry, you don't actually need a complete manufacturing graph in order to fill in that you made a project. You can have holes, incomplete information, 
or finished products with no relationships attached to it at all. So the user who added the yarn marks Krista's dyed roving as material for her yarn, which creates the relationship between the dyed roving and the finished yarn. It's this relationship that expands the graph for dyed roving. It's only relationship creation that updates the graph. So the, again, creation of individual nodes doesn't matter. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. Okay, because we only want to show updates, we need to keep track of the socket on the socket of previously pushed nodes and relationships using node ID set and relationship ID set. Every time a graph update event is broadcast, we intercept it and handle out calculates the difference between the previously seen ID set and the new ID set for the whole graph. The nodes and relationships get filtered down to those with new IDs and then get pushed out. The full set of node and relationship IDs from the current graph are then stored on the socket for any future broadcasts. This way, each time that we receive a broadcast, we only send the diff. This is done on a per socket basis, so any user using multiple sockets will receive the whole graph on each new socket. So the steps for creating it, for create get expanded from just create the repo to doing the old create, followed immediately by a graph query on start or end node of the relationship, and then broadcasting for each node on the graph to the node's graph ID topic. Um, so testing this was kind of a pain. <laughs> uh, to test these real-time updates, we hit multiple controllers to simulate creating relationships over time. Each request to the controller needed us to add bolt sips con to the controller, as for some reason it got stripped off the con each time. So um, if I manually put in that that's where it's going, it worked. Um, I also found that if I couldn't use assert push, because I couldn't specify the topic when using it. Interpolating the topic didn't work, and so giving me, and it gave me a compile error of cannot invoke remote function project ID inside match. But instead, by using assert receive, I was able to get around that problem and still specify the topic. So um, there's some future work to be done on this if we're going to get Neo4j used on Elixir in production. <laughs> Um, I'd like to turn the basics of what I have here into some sort of Ecto wrap, uh, adapter for Neo4j. It's really close, and at this point, I think it would make um, using Neo4j in an Elixir project a lot easier. For the adapter, I'd like to get Ecto schema to do the type conversions and figure out a way, a way to not need to pass bold SipsCon everywhere like I'm doing now. And I'd also like to make some sort of qu query library for this as Ecto isn't going to start supporting Cypher keyword terms anytime soon, and that came from Jose. <laughs> um, so if you're interested about graph databases in Neo4j, uh, there's a few resources. Um, O'Reilly has a free uh, book, PDF download, on the Neo4j website. It's front and center if you can't miss it. There's a really good Cypher reference card. And then um, if you want to learn more, uh, Neo4j is actually having a conference next month in New York, and I'll be going to GraphConnect. So lots of love to these people for helping me out, and I think we're almost out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions or? Yeah. Oh, I think he's giving you a microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Are you aware of anyone uh, looking into using something like Gremlin or Tinkerpop to abstract uh, a graph interface for Ecto? I am not familiar with that, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a good idea. I don't see why not. But um, as, far as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, not many people have tried using a graph database in Elixir, so I don't, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Great, thank you.